YouTube video yeah. went viral, bundled your journey through university, and also began my entire YouTube career. Adam C, you have 638,000 subscribers. Imagining 630,000 people in a stadium, that's a lot of people. People who say they have Kylie Minogue as a poster on their wall, there's a child, I had the stig. I've always been so obsessed with cars. There is so many videos. I actually tried to scroll down to get to the last one. And on your channel, it's the first time I've given up. <laughs> But you did get banned from an event, right? I got banned from an event, yep. Didn't you then turn up to that event in a Where's Wally outfit? I was going to go in, in disguise. We dress as Where's Wally, and the whole time it was people like double taking, like, oh, it's Adam. Do you worry where everything is going? Yes. There's people that don't like what I do. There's always going to be people that don't like what people do, and there's people that don't like me. Adam C, or Adam C3046. Oh yeah, I'm sure we'll come on to that later on. <laughs> In numbers. your own words, yes. who are you and what do you do? I'm Adam C and I, I film videos of cars, but other people's cars, not necessarily my cars, but I've got my cars. That doesn't make sense. I film car shows. I, I, I am probably the car show guru. Is If I, if ever I was to make a new channel, that would be the title, the car show guru. <laughs> and you joined YouTube in 2008. You have 638,000 subscribers, 365 million views. Oh, is it that much? I don't tend to look at the views. <laughs> How does that make you feel when I say those numbers? Um, well, the subscriber, the subscriber one is the one I've been chasing. So obviously everyone looks at subscriber counts and is like, oh, you want 600,000. Oh, you want a million or something. A million subs would be great. But... As I think my, Matt Armstrong's touched upon in previously, it's it's just a number. But imagining six hundred and thirty thousand people in a stadium is like there were people that have decided they want to watch my videos. It doesn't necessarily well, it doesn't equate to my mind, and it doesn't equate to views either. I'm not getting six hundred thousand people watching my videos, but I don't know. It's been a long journey, so it it sounds uh, it sounds wrong to say it, but it, it's hard for me to to uh, like appreciate that number of people because it's just been a long journey. It's a figure I see on a screen. I can't really compute that into people and, and, and loyalty. It's, it's funny. I've never heard anybody else say it because that's exactly what I do is think of a stadium. Yeah. Like it, it, and it's like, if you've had 80,000 views, I just immediately think yeah. of like Wembley or Twickenham. Yeah. So I think it's the only way that humans ever see that many people yeah. in one space. I think, uh, Silverstone this year was about 400,000 people right, okay. turned up to the whole Grand Prix weekend across yeah. camping. And it is actually not that many things across the world, but we can imagine that many people yeah. that kind of compute it. Fortunately, in one I've got space. my, I, I've hosted a couple of car shows myself and we can see a number of people there. So I can visualize, oh, that's 6,000 fans. That's a lot of people. But if I had a vi video that did 6,000 views, I'm like, no one's watched it. So it's it's different to weigh up the, the reality from just the number you see on the screen. Because uh, it was Matt that actually said he thinks he talks to a camera better than he talks yes. to people. Yeah. Would you say that you're the same? Oh, well, I I was always historically a very quiet person. Like a lot of, I, I think a lot of influencers and, and YouTubers are, especially... More of, introverted at the yeah. beginning. Um, and I used to hate talking to cameras. And... But back, I mean, I don't know if we were going to go back, back then, but we, we will, maybe go. We will, we will go, back, go back then. So I won't start going into it. But but back then, it was just Shmi 150. He would talk to cameras. And if anyone else did it, they'd be copying Shmi 150. Then gradually, a few more people did it. Then I felt like I had to do it because uh, people wanted to see it. But I'd, I'd find a quiet corner of a car show and film myself like this. And I am Adam C. And, well, and you just have a... But there is a persona. My real... real Real Adam C is different from YouTube Adam C, but that's again that's the case with most influencers. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's um, I don't know if I prefer talking to people or to a camera because I don't know. I hate phone calls. I can tell you that. But talking to people is fine. Meeting fans is fine. On a stage, I would never want to be on a stage when I was a kid. That would be the worst thing in the world. Like having to perform in front of people and, and stand up and present myself. Now I love it. And it's amazing how I just realized one day, wow, that was amazing. And I would have never have planned to be a stage 
guy, but whenever I am on stage, I'm like, this is great. I can really get like, into this. Yeah, this yeah. is and feel. I think it's because when you're uh, younger, everybody seems to be more of a critic to you. Mm. But when when you're actually at an event that's say got your name on it yeah. and it's your event, you're surrounded by people that are basically there for you. They're paying to come because yeah. of, because it's your event. So I think you end up getting a different kind of people. I think so. Around there, than that yeah. kind of zooms you on a bit. But I wanted to start by basically asking this surely wasn't the plan right mm, when no. you're growing up as a teenager no. youtube full time essentially as you said the car show guru yeah so what was the plan and then what did life look like growing up were you like a massive top gear fan where did oh, the love of cars come yes. from oh so i've this year i've got to know um ben collins the old stig and i haven't told him this because it's a bit weird but People say they had like Kylie Minogue as a poster on their wall in as childhood, or they had like Britney Spears or something. I had the Stig everywhere. I had every Stig merchandise possibly. I had Stig soap on a rope. I had Stig shampoo bottle. I had the Stig poster. I had a Top Gear cool wall. I had every piece of Top Gear merch imaginable. Every Clarkson book, every Hammond's book, every James May book. And I've got all of Ben Collins' books as well. Yep. And um, so I was a huge Top Gear fan. I've always been so obsessed with cars. I've always been the car geek, the car car weirdo and that's throughout as school. As young as you can, as young as I've back. ever been. Like my dad is into cars. When I was when I was a kid, he bought a TVR, and we would go to car shows, Goodwood Festival of Speed, mostly, and a few piston heads meets in his TVR. So obviously that was a help. And he would, as a child, you you either into cars football or I don't, I don't know the third thing cars or football and I, I didn't like football it was fishing in my case fishing <laughs> okay cars, football or something obscure let's, let's yeah, put everything else into the, cars, football or, or you, you I don't know um, and um, cars were always just the, the big thing but my my mum's got my mum's got a book where she writes down every year what we want to do when we're older as a, as a kid so every year she asks what would you like to be when you're older Architects came up a few times because I've always loved the look of houses and architecture and design. But most of the time, it would be Top Gear magazine journalist or Top Gear presenter. And weirdly, a social influencer of, of what I've become, although I hate that word, I think every influencer hates the word influencer, but that's as close to Top Gear presenter as I probably could have become. But that's what I wanted to be as a kid. But I was never going to be. I was like, oh, photographer. I was into photography. but. I, I really didn't know where I was going to go. I um I I would never have planned to do YouTube as a career. It was just a hobby that turned into a career. Otherwise, I would have chosen a username that wasn't Adam C three zero four six. The classic gamer tag carried yeah. uh, carried over to YouTube. Well, that was, it was actually Bebo. If you if you ever remember Bebo, it was that was slightly before me. I yeah, think, I was going to but... say. I think it was just a little bit before you. Um, so it was obviously a competitor to Facebook for a younger, a bit more arty, and they gave you a username based on your first name, your initial, and then just random numbers. So I'd use that everywhere. And as you said, 2008, started a YouTube channel just to dump videos. Fortunately, my first videos were car videos. They were Bugatti Veyron on driving through Goodwood films. I was going to ask yeah. if you remembered your first oh, YouTube yes. Everyone video. Everyone remembers their first. And do you remember <laughs> how many years ago that was? So... Fortunately, you did say 2008 at the start. Otherwise, I can never remember if it's 2007 or 2008. That's because I filmed it in 2007, but I uploaded it January 2008. Oh, the Veyron had only been around a year by then mm. as well, to be fair. Yeah, so it was Goodwood Festival of Speed in the first glance paddock. I think it was the first time I saw one, maybe the second time, because I went to the MPH show at uh, like Top Gear Live. I, yeah, obsessed. You remember all of these things, oh, don't yeah. you? yeah. Because uh, I've had it a few times. People say, probably not as much as other other car car guys, oh, you're not really into cars. It's all just a, a ploy just to become someone. And I can't imagine how anyone could point that to me because I am... Or think the, that you're not into yeah, cars. Yeah, to think I'm not into cars. I, it's, it's just unfathomable, which is a word I can't even pronounce. And um, no, it's just, I've been so, so, so obsessed. It kind of makes sense that I've come into this. But yeah, the Vey one was just filmed with my little compact digital camera like that you'd have the really rubbish, like, I don't know, 1440p or something ridiculous, really grainy, really rubbish sound. But I uploaded it just somewhere to put it. And then I do, but I do animal videos. I do skiing videos. I do just any, it was just a dump for videos. Anything that reflected basically stuff that you were interested in. Or... Something that I just thought, I mean, 
as a kid, like I was aware, I don't think viral was a term back then, but I was aware of like big viewed videos and I wanted to get big viewed videos. I did, I had some um, um, almost pirated videotapes of a BBC series that I had for my dad that he downloaded, not pirated, but downloaded from DVD. And I think I'd uploaded them and then they got a copyright thing. I was like, okay, because when you're a kid, you don't understand yeah, copyright yeah. and stuff. And uh, um, so I think I'd even tried putting up series onto YouTube because again, back then, that's what people would do. They'd upload episodes of, um, I don't know, I think it was coupling BBC series. It was more of somewhere to put something, wasn't yeah. it? It was a drive before a yeah. drive was created and online. I would go to festivals and I'd film like Metallica's stage performance at Download or um, Jesus Christ Superstar with Tim Minchin, just random stuff, upload it. So how old were you then? Oh, that's something I, I'd have to work out. I don't actually know the answer off How the top old of my are you head. Now? I'm 28 now, and I can't be bothered to do the maths. <laughs> in your teen, you were a teenager. <laughs> I was in the teens, yes. Um, so I think it was it was definitely in school because some another video was like a little bunny rabbit eating a, a leaf, and that was on a year six school trip that I'd filmed it. So maybe it was around year six, year seven. Because, because something that I uh, found out when I was doing my research in this mm -hmm. episode because I delved deep into kind of every part of your channel and everywhere yeah. was I came across a subscriber count with the year next yes. to it. Yes. Uh, it hidden in the about tab yeah. on yeah, your YouTube channel. I don't shout channel. about it but it's there. And it says first subscriber 30th of the 1st 2008. So that I think the first two are made up I think. Okay. It yeah. says 10 subscribers 6th of the 1st 2010. Yep. 100 subscribers, 3rd of the 8th, 2012. That's correct. That date is, the, yeah. 1,000 subscribers was also 2012, two months later. So you went from 100 to 1,000 in two months. Yep. And then 10,000 subscribers was two years after that in 2014. 100,000 subscribers was a further two years after that, which was mm -hmm. in 2016. And... As you say, the next one. <laughs> the next I one's feel a million. Like you should have 250k and 500 in there, but I know I keep it to the one thing. But the next, one, the, one, yeah. the, the next one says a million. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? And what I took from that was persistence. Mm. Because there is, it, I actually try on most of my guests to scroll down if they've got a channel to the bottom of yeah. their videos to get to the last Good one. Luck with that. And on your channel, it's <laughs> the first time I've given up. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm scrolling and I sat there and I just on my phone, I was trying to just yeah. get that. And I went, oh, there's a tab that I could just click and go straight to the bottom on this. I've yeah. never had that before because there is so many videos. Yeah. So what I want to get into is once you'd started, you obviously had this massive passion for cars. That's something that, uh, you know, lots of people do end up trying to follow their passions in some yeah. way, shape or form. When did the little bulb flick along that period from 2008 to 2016 say mm. that you were like hang on I can earn some money off of this there, there is there is a point there is a point I think I know what it is as well so I think from 1000 to 10,000 or maybe from even from 100 to 1000 that all happened in 2012 that date was highlighted twice in those statistics 2012 when people ask me when I started I say I properly started in the summer of 2012 because that is when I realized, oh, I could make a thing out of this. And I decided on a niche because in YouTube, in anything, you need a niche. You can't just upload animal videos, car videos, this, that and the other. And I decided from now on, I would do car videos. And that was the point. And it, it, it started with a video that wasn't a car video, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a little bit or maybe now. I don't know. Um, and that, that was no, called, go uh, yeah, yeah. that was uh, Dog Saves Cat from Fox. Mm. The most grainy, red-eyed fox that oh, looks yes. like a demon you've and ever seen. I didn't even film it. My mum filmed it. <laughs> you can hear me in the video saying, oh, no battery, because I brought out my video camera, because at that point I, I'd, I had a video camera at that point because I wanted to film everything. I wanted to make it as a, as a popular video, influencer wasn't a term, as a popular video maker or something. And um, so I couldn't actually film it. So my mum just had her little video camera point and shoot. Basically, what happened at my parents' house, my mum saw a fox out in the garden in the daylight. They're nocturnal-ish. And it was like, oh, what's it doing out in the daylight? Since then, we've seen loads of foxes doing this. So for some reason, both me and my mum decided this is definitely worth filming because who sees foxes out in the day? I Right now, I would not film it. Like, 
I don't know why we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, no. It was back in 2012. Who knows back what in 2012, we were doing, Yeah, Batman. we'd film everything. A magpie would land on a tree and we'd be like, that's content. That's viral. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so she filmed it. And then Buster, the neighborhood cat from two doors down, kind of ran into a frame. The fox saw the cat and started running after the cat. And my brother was also with us and he was holding my dog, Roxy, a miniature Labradoodle, who's not even in the video at all, but she barks. You can hear her bark. She barks at the fox because she doesn't understand what a fox is really. And the box stops, looks, and then runs away. And then looks back at the camera. And because of like, you know, bad cameras, you get red eye. It had like Terminator red eye. It did. <laughs> so I had a bit of sense. I used that scene as the thumbnail. And I think that's what gave it a few a bit of traction. And that's it. It's 42 seconds of pure rubbish. And it, it, it's, it started getting views. It, Straight away or just no, after a little period? I think I uploaded in April 2012. I think it was April. And then we went on holiday to, I think, Egypt, maybe like a family holiday. And I will always remember this. I came back from holiday and I, I saw, whoa, wait a minute. And I went to my mum and said, mum, something's happened. They were, they were the words I said. I always remember that. I don't know why I remember that, but that is almost like the turning point. I think in that week it had gone to maybe 100 or 200,000 views which I think I had had a video, maybe a, I think it was a compilation of pictures of crashes I'd found on the internet, obviously uploaded as a kid years ago, that was on half a mil. That's since gone because of it's not really me. But I hadn't seen a video do that. So I was like, it's going viral. I don't know if viral was the term. And August of 2012, which was, this was September, I think. August of 2012 was when I first started being able to monetize YouTube videos. Obviously a young teenager, I was like, yeah, I want to earn money from this yeah. rubbish that I'm uploading. So I had already connected my bank account and started monetizing. I think the first, it was the end of, end of July, I started monetizing. Uh, so the first month that was like, I don't know, 14p because it was like the last day. And then the second month was, I think something like 50 or 60 pounds, maybe it might be very different to that, but, but a low, a low figure for a month's worth of content. And then suddenly, again, I don't know the figures, suddenly this viral video started going. And the reason it went viral, you will like this. Do you remember Gangnam Style? Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason. So algorithm and everything was all very different back then. And short videos would get good money. These days, short videos don't get good money at all. But um, what would happen is these days, the recommended video tab is based on your personal recommendations. But back then, recommended videos was based on the video that's being watched. So everyone would have the same recommendations down the side. So Gangnam Style was going viral. And then the top recommended video from Gangnam Style was something like Hippo Butt Explosion Diarrhea. Mm, it was a very good video. And it's basically a hippo passing and having diarrhea everywhere. That's what people wanted to see back in 2012. And then the most recommended video from the hippo video was Dog Saves Cat from Fox. Somehow it had got there. So people were clicking from Gangnam Style to Hippo Explosion, Explosive Diarrhea to my rubbish 40 second video of, a, of, a, of a, my dog barking at a fox. And that video funded my entire way through university. So I didn't need to get a part time job and bought my first car, which is my MGB. And uh, it it started a YouTube video yeah. of dog saves cat from fox, of, where the dog wasn't even on camera and yep. it was filmed on the worst camera known to man by my mum with red eye, which wasn't even something that videographers would want, but mm. ended up turning good. Went viral because of Gangnam Style, and then funded your journey through university and bought an MJ, and also began my entire YouTube career. <laughs> <laughs> you I couldn't have foreseen that, I could know, you? Exactly. That's why, as you were saying earlier, you can't plan to become this thing. And and from then it would it would get eventually it would reach a million views after a month or two, maybe. And I was just watching the money coming in. Does and it still earn? It I think it earned I, th I looked at it the other day. I think in the last 28 days I got maybe six pounds from it. So it earns a little right, bit okay. of pocket money. <laughs> um but I think I was earning a four-figure sum a month from this video, which Imagine a university student getting 800, then a thousand pounds a month, maybe 1500. I, I think I might have pe peaked at 2000 pounds a month, one of the months in like the November afterwards. 
And I was just like, this is amazing. I just started <laughs> university. Like, I don't need to work. So I've never actually, this is going to sound all, I've never actually worked in retail. I haven't had that normal work experience through the ranks, like working at a bar. Like when I, I did work experience as a kid at a medical insurance broker, and then I, I stayed there as a part-time job. So again, I didn't do a stereotypical job then. And yeah, throughout uni, but yes, it was that video that started it. And then when I started earning from it, I decided the channel needs a niche. Cars are my passion. So from then on, no more animal videos, no more fail videos of my brother falling off his skateboard or something. From now on, car videos. And in August of 2012, obviously I'd watch Shmi 150, I'd watch Supercars of London, and I would like spotting in London. August 2012 was my first trip to London to look at supercars. And then from November 2012 onwards is when I properly began going to London regularly. And then the next summer I'd go to more events and I'd do a bit of car spotting, a bit of car shows. And I do photography as well as videos because that was still my passion was taking photos. That's where I initially saw you was through photography yeah. on Instagram, etc. Yeah. And that was before a face had come on camera. Yes, yes, because oh no, a face was not on camera, no. And I would never talk on camera. But that process yeah. of you beginning uh, basically a career in YouTube because you realized it was possible. Mm. You started that alongside university. Yes. Then. What did you do at university? So I did graphic design because I've always... I'm also a big music fan and I've always loved the design of of uh, LPs, of, of albums, album covers, of CDs. And that's got me into graphic design as well as architecture was another passion. And then I did a college um, little taster course thing and that scared me because it was too mathematic and science. I just wanted to draw pretty houses. I didn't want to care about weather and, and safety and all that nonsense. So I did graphic design and because of my YouTube journey, I did not get the degree that I want the the grade was yeah, I didn't get the results the result that you wanted that I wanted in university and I had a very poor unsociable university experience I probably made one friend and I did not enjoy my time at uni whatsoever but I spent most of the time doing YouTube and now at least I can say it was worth it why do you think you didn't enjoy that time period because as you said, yeah. you're now the guy um, that is more than happy to stand on stage in front of yeah. a load of people. You're now the guy that will be with us hopefully on a plane on the way to Vegas in a couple yeah. of weeks. I'm also the guy that likes dancing the Macarena to any you're... song played in a nightclub. Which... There you go, Chiro. Why didn't you send me the video? <laughs> I was going to play it. Was it was meant to be a video, <laughs> but unfortunately not. He's so... also the guy that um, sings happy birthday to Shmi drunk. But... <laughs> <laughs> yes, with a broken foot and a bleeding hand. So you'd think that guy would be the party-loving, yes. animal, fun guy that would have absolutely smashed university yeah. out of the park but he wasn't no um that's what i'm coming back I'm to what try we were saying some madam c's chocolate oh, yeah, cider now chocolate cider it's 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 amazing i wouldn't have a pint of it at 11 a.m yep so um i do think now if i was to go back to uni i would i would enjoy it i would i would do what most people do at uni and just go out and club and club do the club and um i i think i would let my hair down if you want to Use have a that dance battle channel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I just I tried to get into it, but I never, I never quite did. I never liked clubbing. I only went because I was like, well, it's, it's what's it's what's done. And I didn't really make that many friends. I didn't have a good time and I regretted my time. And the debt is still there <laughs> from university. So does that mean then, as you said, 2012 was a pivotal moment yep. because you decided to actually try and make a career out of doing uh, YouTube. Yes. Going to university is a huge step and you wanted to get something out of that, but mm -hmm. maybe that journey didn't go as you thought it would. There must be a pivotal moment in there somewhere where you changed as a person quite a bit. Was yeah. that the moment you put your face on camera? No. So everything other than the initial dog saves cat from Fox and lockdown, but we'll come on to that later. Everything's been very gradual. Maybe it's slightly... Just like the subscriber basis yeah. persistent exponential to a point but gradual um so there wasn't really too many but that that i i've recognized points um so i think 2013 maybe no it wouldn't have been 13 14 or 15 i went to monaco for top marks which was a supercar show i remember top marks yeah. I, used to, I used to be buzzing back then yeah because there was too little content back then rather than too much yes. content back then. 
And when stuff like that happened, the likes of GT Spirit, GT Adam Spirit, C, yeah. you'd be waiting for the photos. Yeah, and like Shmi 150, he'd yeah. go there. Uh, seen through glass, he would also. And then I, I went there. I didn't take a car there. I went on a plane with some friends. And my first time at Monaco, I decided, well, I'd make a just like a like almost like a behind the scenes style video, just of us generally messing around. And there was a bit of talking, not commentary, but kind of talking um, and just banter. And it was such a fun video that people that did watch it said, you need to do more of this. So from then on, that's when I was like, oh, maybe there's a bit, because there is a bit of comedy to my videos. And there's people that say, stop trying to be funny, but other people genuinely enjoy the, the humor. And again, back back then car channels were very serious they were about the cars they were about the people they were but there was no like entertainment well there was entertainment value but not in humor per se so i was like if i introduce a bit of personality a bit of banter uh, and sly sarcastic comments which is now what i've been known for controversial controversial comments um then I, I thought that would be something that people would enjoy um i think maybe my first time filming my face was when i bought my mg at university, which was my first car. And I felt like a car reveal needs to be like, so as if you go back to the video, it's like, hi guy, I, I've just bought a car and um, it's, I'm not looking in the lens that much either. And it's just behind me now. And I tried to be funny and say, and here it is pointing at a Lamborghini and then continuing the line up just along here further down. And I, I don't know, I was trying to do it a bit different. It was a rubbish video. Um, yeah, I'd started, but I still was not comfortable with with presenting because I was never into presenting as a as a kid through college through uni, and again it just was more gradual. So I'd go to Monaco at future points, and I would um um yeah I'd, I'd do more kind of behind the scenes, and I've just remembered something very controversial that was was a pivotal moment. Oh, snacks. We've got Adam C snack bowl here. Yeah, <laughs> oh, well, we, we need to mention that because it's in view. <laughs> mention it. It's yeah. in view. Bold Steve is now in view as well. Oh, I don't know, towards the end, I'll, I'll talk about obviously buying a house through YouTube, and then I can talk about the housewarming, and then talk about, well, that's where this came from. Well, this is on camera, to be honest with you. <laughs> Look at that. I'll go and dive. I've nearly finished my chocolate cider. Mm. <laughs> I'm not dipping the Dip chocolate. the chocolate in the chocolate cider. Oh, my All God. All right, I'm going to dip. Oh. Never did I think on a podcast with Adam C, I'd be dipping a dime bar in chocolate cider at 11 15 in the morning. No, I'm right for the sour cream. Thanks, Steve. Right, here we go. I've just blown your mind, haven't I? That's fucking horrendous. (laughs) (laughs) Behind the scenes with Adam C. Yeah, dipping dime bars in chocolate. Mm. Um, But just before I break, we came to a... Con- I'm going to try and move away from the mic in a minute from Crunch Crunch Time. Yum, yum. Very loud. We came to a controversial uh, moment. Yes. You're going to tell us a story. It's a story. So, um, obviously, doing what I was doing, um, I would meet a lot of great people through going to car shows. And, uh, sorry, my mouth's watering so much because there's all these snacks in front. It's lovely. Um... So I'd meet some great friends. There were also y- younger people with classic cars. So um, my friend David, DDM Historics, was is his online tag. And... I, I kind of think we've actually skipped that a little bit. You bought an MGB as your oh, first yes. car. Oh, yes. Should we talk about that before I think the we, I think we yeah. should, actually. Okay, because this does kind of tie into it. So um, I, I didn't want a traditional first car. I wanted to show people that I was an enthusiast. I didn't want, like... Um, I'm not going to name any cars because a lot of the cars I film, a lot of the audience of mine do own these cars. Yeah. Um, so I won't say, oh, I didn't want to own any of these cars because no. But I didn't want the traditional first car. I wanted something different. And I remember, again, another memory that stuck with me coming downstairs and my dad saying, what's about an MGB? And I never liked MGBs because they were the, the common classic car you'd see. Oh, the classic. Oh, it's just another MGB. But I thought, that looks like a sports car. That's going to get me girls. It didn't. Got me none, zero, throughout <laughs> university. It was parked on the streets out with all the other university guy cars. And there was my MGB and me like, yeah, that's yeah. right. Nothing. That's exactly like me at my first sports car. Yeah. And then I looked in the mirror and realized I was 20 stone at that point. Oh, right, <laughs> and right. maybe that was the thing that needed to happen See, rather me, than I, the I car. Was, I, was, I think I was dressing like an old man as well as driving an old man's car. So I'd, I'd like the loud shirts, which I've toned down a little bit more recently. And... um 
it was between that or a Triumph Dolomite Sprint, but the do- Dolly didn't look as sporty as an MG. I would have earned more money on the Dolly Sprint than the MG. But yeah, I got the MGB GT, which is the hard top. So it's more practical, but it has the sunroof, so you can have the best of both worlds. And that was my car throughout uni, and I'd take to car shows. Um, and it was great. And it was reliable enough. Um, I didn't, but because of YouTube, I didn't need a classic job. Um, so I didn't need a reliable car to get to a job. So I could live with a classic car as my only car, my oh, daily car. Um, so yes, I'd meet these other people from going to car shows. but also young people with classic cars. So David would have his Alfa Romeo, uh, junior GT junior. And then a friend called Sean, who was known as VTSV. Um, he also had a small YouTube channel as well. He just bought a Mustang, uh, a GT 350 replica fast back or not fast back um and we got to know each other through like goodwood events uh, and then later on ollie who had a triumph gt6 so we were young people with classic cars and we did a three classics series which is like a, a road trip video uh in our three classic cars so first it was me in the mg sean in a cage that you just bought as well and then david and his alpha driving around the isle of wight um because of my poor mapping skills we kind of we didn't do a lap of the isle of wight we did down the middle, and then the last part, but it was a great video. Uh, and then we did another tour, which was finding rude place names in Dorset, I think it was. So there's, oh, there's a, quite a few, to be fair. Yeah, I've seen... um, so there was um, Shitterton is a general, genuine name for, a, I think it's like a hamlet, like a small village like area. Um, so that was one. So we got pictures of our cars next to that. There was a big sign. Um, and um, Happy Bottom was another one. And... Um, Oh, so, oh, there's so many. So we did a tour around. As I, I did some Googling and I found as, as as many as I could rude like place names in the area. And we did a tour in our classics. This time it was me and the MGB. Sean didn't bring a car, but there was an Alfa Romeo and then Ollie's Triumph GT6. So again, another road trip video that I put a bit of effort into. Um, and I've, I've heard rumor that the Grand Tour are planning an episode whereby they do a tour around rude place names. So if that happens, I'm going to bring back this video and say, I was first. The original Top Gear boys you grew up loving as a yep. kid. Almost copying yeah, your copy video. my content, yeah. Imagine that. I know. I've, I've, got to, I, I have, I have got to meet Richard Hammond once. I haven't met Clarkson or May yet. But, but, so. but this led to a, that. So throughout that led to a bit of a controversial moment with another YouTuber? Yes. So, um, obviously we got some to meet people. Um, but one of the people that would also frequent car shows and make YouTube videos was a gentleman called Anthony who ran a channel called Gas Kings. Um, very animated and pretty much the perfect format for uh, good video um, content, making great good I views. I remember it. But I it haven't very thought like, about it since back then. I know, I know. So it was very like, hello and welcome to Gas Kings. I didn't have that energy back then. He did. And I, I was almost envious of his views he was getting and the videos he was making. And he was doing quite well for himself. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it later transpired. He, he was doing some naughty um, money stuff in the background and... And I, I won't go into details because he he was a genuine like like pal of ours in the car scene. Um, so he did get into trouble and, and left the scene. To put it lightly, he ended up in prison. And I, um, but but I think he might have been another pivotal moment because I remember him telling me, Adam, back back at this point, I was commentating in in some videos if it if i was making a vlog video for example walking around a car show i would narrate cars leaving a car show no i don't narrate that video that's just cars leaving let the cars do the talking compilations and this video and that video i don't narrate all of them and he told me adam you need to be narrating every single video that you upload because people follow people they want to follow follow a journey they want to have commentary throughout and i think 2018, I believe it was, from that point to the start of that year, I decided every single video I upload, other than maybe best of compilations, because it's difficult to do it, um, I have tried, it didn't work, uh, every single video that I would film, I would introduce a start with like, hi, I'm Adam C and welcome to, and I would talk throughout the video. And that really, I think, did gave a boost in the gradual growth to my channel, because people would want to follow me as a person and people would watch the videos for longer because without the commentary, it's just car, car, car. They can just get bored and put off. But with commentary, you create narrative, you create a story. 
so people will watch longer. And the longer people watch a video for, the more revenue you get from that video. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why podcasts is, podcasts are great. Um, I, I haven't tried the, the old podcast uh, malarkey, but it seems like there's a lot of uh, money involved in setting it up. So maybe I won't. Uh, I'll just. If join. you decide to buy a van and convert mm. the whole thing, then maybe yes. Yeah, I was amazed but, when I found out this was a van. I thought it was just like a studio. You'd, you'd seen it before yeah. online, but you didn't. You thought it was somewhere that I'd yeah. let you drive to. Yeah, because I've had in, invitations to go to podcasts before, and I'm like, maybe like, I had one the other day, which was like 15 minutes down the road, but I didn't really fancy getting up and going somewhere just to talk about me. Um, but it's great. It's a great idea. Um, but honestly, I think, yeah, I think 2018 and was from, from Gas King's advice has really helped me decide where, where, where to push it. And that, that did help me out. And you'd have, you'd have been on a couple of hundred thousand subscribers by then. You were earning yes. AdSense revenue. It's consistent. Yeah. You'd figured out, do you know what? I can turn this YouTube channel into my full-time yes. career and business. So then every decision you were making from then on was quite almost pivotal. pivotal. Or it, it sounds like you'd kind of, have a bit of a plan at the start of the year and be like, I'm going to go with this narrative this year. I'm yeah. going to nar- narrate the videos this year. I'm going to go for this style of year and then just kind of stick to it and try it for a period of time. I think, a bit like the persistence thing coming back. Yeah, well, I, I never want to try something. I just want to do something. So I, I, I was certain enough that doing this would, would work. So I don't, I don't want to say I was trying it out. I was deciding this is where I'm going now. And I was confident that it was going to work. And it seems to have done. At that point, uh, obviously, I'd come out of uni by then. And I was actually working a full-time job. And people don't really know much about this because I, I've never really delved into like personal life too much, especially back then when I had a job as well. So when I came out of uni, um, I'd met um, someone from car shows who'd brought a car to a show. I'd filmed his car, so I got to know him. And then well, I, I think um, I was literally, I was at a celebratory graduation meal with my parents and grandparents and um this chap called henry he he on my facebook post he said the comment get now get a job you bum was the comment i remember that comment and then during this graduation celebratory meal i was messaging him organizing a job interview so he owns a car storage facility down the road from where my parents uh, used to live and um Basically, we organized an interview. The job interview was in a Ferrari 355, so not too bad. And I, for several years, worked in a car storage facility alongside YouTube. And I have no idea how I managed to fit in YouTube, a full-time job, and having a girlfriend. Because that takes time as well. So why was that? Is that because YouTube was a bit inconsistent? Because you were relying on AdSense revenue, yes. which is up one month and down the next? Yeah. So I, I didn't have the balls as well. Um, so YouTube was inconsistent. I was like, oh, I can't rely on this. I'm not like, I'm not Shmi 150. I'm not a big time. I'm just going by getting a bit of money. So I had my full-time job that was earning me like sensible money. I was still living with my parents, but I was trying to save and save for mortgage, ended up just buying cars instead. And I had the YouTube to, that was kind of my play thing. And I could see, and I, Throughout this job, I knew that I was at a stage where I could do YouTube full time, but I didn't have the balls to do it. I, I didn't want to leave the staple job. And my, my dad's quite traditional in, in saying, oh, you need a job, you need this this uh, security. So I don't know. I, I was worried what he would think about it. He has since realized, yes, this YouTube thing works. And he, he's very, I think, proud of me. But I didn't have the balls. And in the end... Um, the, the, the dreaded C word, the the, uh, the illness that happened in 2020. I don't know if that still uh, flags up bad things. Every episode, something did some that that period of time did something to every guest yeah. that's come on. So due to that period in time, I was made redundant from my job. I was let go, and I mem- I remember the the drive back. I think I was in my 350Z. I'd had at that point. Whilst in my head, I was like, it's not the end of the world. I've still got YouTube, and it wasn't. It was by no means a high paying job. It was, if anything, quite a low paying job, but it was in the car car industry. I got to drive so many cars at like five miles an hour, Veyrons, DB4 Zagaso, 250 GTs, and like so many incredible cars that I would never have been in touch with, but now, and that was just gone. And yeah, the drive back, I was just no radio, just silent to myself. Just like, well, what now? 
And then the days later, I was thinking, and this was during lockdown. So I was like, I had nothing to do. And I was thinking, what do I do? It's really not that long ago. And it, no, it's not. But things have changed a lot since then for the, for the better. And I, I managed to turn things around because for me, I specialized in car shows and I used to go spotting in London, not so much anymore because that's died a little bit. And there were no more car shows. I couldn't do anything. So I had to come up with my own ways of still uploading content because I upload most of the year, I upload one video every two days. Uh, in the winter, it's one video every three days. And sometimes I can change up a bit. Um, so that's a lot of videos. As you were saying earlier, I, I upload so many videos to keep it going. And I didn't have that. I, I didn't have that. So I was making compilations. I was trying this, trying that. And I made the video that I told myself I would never make of fails. Because people like seeing fails and crashes and accidents and, and things going wrong. So I made a crash compilation throughout lockdown. Whilst I had this free time, I went through all my videos from 2012 up to 2020, eight years of content, went through everything and picked out every little mishap from accidents, which fortunately I haven't seen that many accidents happen. You'd expect from the, the cars leaving and the stuff that I do, the, what would you class in terms of, say, accidents? You mean like badly binning it rather than just, oh, we spun it in, spun well, out? Spinning, yeah, that's spinning out, but like contact. I've only really seen one really, or filmed one serious accident, but again, no really serious, no no injuries. No one died. Yeah, and I don't think anyone's been injured from any of the things that I've witnessed, so that's great as well. Um, and I, I hate I hate filming them, and I hate uploading but that's what people want to see. So it's like, that's why I was never going to do it. So I don't want to glorify people's misfortune, but you see all these other channels doing it. I had nothing else in lockdown, so I uploaded it. And that video, 17 minutes long, is now on 24 million views. It's one of the most popular car videos on the internet. And that was my little lockdown project. And that video alone funded, funded lockdown. lockdown. <laughs> You're you're the king of providing yourself <laughs> income for like the next period of time when I know, something I happens. Feel, aren't you? It's, I feel horrible saying it because I it's you just look like a bad person because I, I filmed all these things and it's but I, I I blur people's identity number plates and faces so I don't want people to be twinned with what's happened. It's just an occurrence that's happened from no fault of anyone or well normally it's from fault of someone but no fault of my own at least and I've just been there happening to filming it. I want to come come back to that in a minute yes I, I have some bits absolutely on that. yes but that drive home so how far away was that car storage place so where you were living fortunately it was only three three miles away so it wasn't a long drive so you'd had years of getting to know youtube yeah you then had a stability job and then you had the two perfect things basically come together you're mm. working really hard but then suddenly there's no job and there's no there's no car shows yeah at the start, and like maybe in some of the research, I was trying to find a bit of a pivotal moment that had been like, well, there surely must have been yes. one time that's probably the hardest time on that this journey. Was that it? I don't know, because um, lockdown was fun. Like there was some, not all, oh, imagine that, that, that link, lockdown was fun. That, that sound clip's going to be taken and you, no. But th there was some fun elements to lockdown, just being able to relax and not having as much pressure on to do something, especially having been made redundant. The first full day of lockdown was my birthday. We had plans to go on a big cider tour. We had to scrap that. So my girlfriend brought me a cider festival in a box and we just tried cider in the back garden and the weather was amazing. I got into running. I, I was doing half marathons every other day. I'd never ran before and I, I just wanted to explore the area and I drew like a map of every route that I did. So I've got this map of every run I did over lockdown. I lost so much weight and as you can see, I haven't got much weight to lose. I was thin. I was tiny because I was just running and running and running as something to do, something to explore. I was, had music in my ears. I was buying albums, buying so many different pieces of music that I wanted to, to try out and listen to and, and explore and, and try and do something because I needed to fulfill what was missing. Where does that positivity come from? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone I've spoke to about um, Adam that knows you, and luckily some of my friends are really close with you. Yeah just says he is the most wonderful, happy, positive person in yeah. the world. And you'll struggle to find anything <laughs> <laughs> that's just not positive yeah. or happy. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't like sitting in traffic. That makes me angry. <laughs> if you filmed so many, as I say, a 24 million view fail video. Yeah. And not only the fail videos and the completions, but if you're filming um, 
the say, a typical car show, leaving a car show, leaving Jack yeah. Fest or something like that. And someone embarrasses themselves, much like I did the other night. Yes. And spins out. Yep. Um, Heard about that. First time in years. <laughs> I, that had a dent in my confidence that yeah. day. But, Better than a dent in the car. Yeah. And someone spins out or someone does bin it and writes off part of the car, say a wheel or yeah. whatever. Have you had those people contact you before and be like, take that out of the video right now? I, I have. And um, there's been a few, a couple of moments where someone has, has asked to, and out of courtesy, I've said, okay, that's fine. I will. But most of the time, I will say, look, I, I've, I've, I've blurred your identity. I've blurred your plate. This, this car isn't necessarily recommend, uh, rec- recognizable. So it can't really be put to you. And at the end of the day, like, but it, it's, it's trying to find a balance of not. There's a fine line. To I don't balance. want to create enemies. I'm not here to make enemies. You don't want to turn I'm, up at the next car show and get knocked out. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> And this whole journey of mine, there's people that don't like what I do. There's always going to be people that don't like what people do. And there's people that don't like me. They've probably never met me, but there's people that don't because they see my videos. Like, oh, that Adam guy, he's doing this, doing that and glamorizing this and that. And I'm just doing what, what I enjoy and what people enjoy watching and create entertaining content. And it's trying to find, again, a balance. But I do my best to, I've always blurred number plates if I think someone I, I blur the plates if I think someone would want their plate to be blurred. That's why I do it. But it takes hours because I don't have an automatic tracker thing because they're really unreliable. I have to go pause play, move it, pause play, move it. And I just sit there again, listening to music and just it, it can take maybe three, three hours per video, depending on how many plates. Sometimes I've spent like nine hours on a, on just blurring number plates on a video, especially the crash compilation. That was, but oh, we had lockdown. There was, Plenty of time. Nothing to um, do. So I, tr- I try and blur people's identity. If the if there is something really serious that shouldn't be uploaded, I'm sensible enough to not upload it. But you still enjoy going to those the meets and filming the cars late. Oh, yeah, it's, it's my it's still my. It's passion. the same as what it was four years ago. Yeah. Some obviously I do I do have to keep things going because as I said I upload every one every other day. So a lot of the time I do have to go to a show just to make content. Or it's like, oh, there's no shows. I need to go to something. Sorry to interrupt there because I think that's quite pivotal. Because when I walked in um, your house a minute ago, you've got your crutches against the wall. <laughs> do you want to just explain what you did the other night to actually film a video when you weren't able to drive or get a lift? Yeah, so I, 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 I broke some bits in the heel of my foot a couple of weeks ago at Petrol Hedonism Live, which is a two-day event. On the evening in between, a group of us went out. We decided to go to a laser party. And I just kind of jumped, pegged it over a central reservation. I think it looked amazing. Honestly, I think I I finessed this, you know, like uh, Shaun of the Dead or uh, Hot Fuzz when they jump over a fence. Yeah. I think before the landing, it looked amazing. And then I landed with too much of a thud on the heel and I couldn't put any weight on it. Went to hospital the next day to get x-rayed and got crutches and whatnot. So I... I I can now walk on it, but not for an extended period of time. But recently I went to one of my regular meets, which is the Reading Japanese meet, which normally is like a 25 minute drive, half an hour drive, maybe in traffic. Um, But I took a two hour public transport excursion just to get there because I was like, well, I can't miss it. I don't want my buffoonery to make me forfeit having this video because that will that will mean I'm going to more likely to run out of videos because that's the whole time I'm trying not to run out of videos. I don't want to get there. That's why in winter I do spread out content a little bit more. Um, so I, 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 on my crutches, walked to town, which was a horrible journey. I was in so much pain. with the. Ha- if anyone's used crutches before, it crushes your hands. And I was like, well, do I try and walk on the foot? So I was trying a bit of mixture of that, crushing my, hurting my foot. And I was so out of breath by the time I got to the bus stop. I didn't know... The bus timetable was so inaccurate. So and this was just the beginning. <laughs> this was the start. So I didn't know if the bus was going to be there. And then eventually waited for the bus, got on the bus, got a bus to fairly near where I needed to go. Buses don't really go where you want to go. You think a bus would go to a train station, but no, I had to do another walk to a train station. So that was another 10 minute, 20 minute walk. And then get onto one train that changed at another station. So I had to then, it made me realize for like disabled people, people in the wheelchairs, one of the platforms I joined, there's no way for anyone with a, like less ability able to walk in a wheelchair to actually cross over to the other platform because it's quite it was quite an old station. There was just steps over a bridge. There was no disabled access, and just made it really opened my eyes. Like, like there is still 
very limited access for disabled people in some areas. I know we're moving to a tangent, but like being on crutches really opens your eyes. So luckily I could hop up some steps with the crutches. They when they gave me the crutches, I say, Oh, don't don't use it for steps, but what else am I gonna do? Like slide on my hips or something. Yeah, you've I don't got know. to get to Reading Jack Meet somehow. I've got to get there somehow. So yeah, two trains, there was a change, then another train, then into Reading, then down to a bus stop and onto another bus that didn't arrive when I wanted to arrive because that's the bus. And that got me fairly near the location I wanted to get to because it's a bus. And then I had to walk again from there to the entrance to film the cars arriving. I was the first to arrive because I gave myself three hours to get there because I didn't know how long it took. It was it took over two hours in the end to to get to that meet. And I was like I have to get there to make the content. Luckily, a friend of mine was going to the meet and he could give me a lift back. But most people work during the day, so they couldn't have given me a lift there initially. So a, a, that's a quite hour. dedication. Yeah. So, so how many videos ahead do you normally like to be? Cause, yes. Because Misha was the one that blew my mind on this. Yeah. Because he uh, was said that he was 180 videos ahead. Wow. Or, or he had roughly that amount in yeah. the bank to go out. Because they shut the Nürburgring in winter. Yes. He has to have them. So for content. I do a similar thing. I do have a huge, uh, not huge, like him, a backlog of content to an extent because winter car shows slows down. So I can make compilations to an extent, but I still save some videos for winter as well. Um, but car shows, unlike Nürburgring content, car shows need to be uploaded when the show is relevant. Because if a show happened, five weeks ago, then I upload it. The people that are at the show, it's kind of gone out of their head. They're less likely to want to watch the video. So I try and put relevant videos out as soon as I can. But normally it's about a two to three week backlog that I hold at least, sometimes up to four weeks. So I've got a diary where I place videos and drag them around. And I want that like three week buffer. So at least if for one week I can't film something or I go on holiday, that, that doesn't mean I've run out of content. I've still got two weeks of content. And you mentioned you've never really pissed anybody off, but you did get banned from an event, right? I got banned from an event, yep. As I said, people, because obviously... Didn't you then turn up to that event in a Where's Wally outfit? Oh, yes. So a lot of a lot of my videos are cars leaving a car show because, again, back when I started, there, was the, there were supercar channels that would film supercars leaving a car shows, maybe five events a year. And I would love those videos. No one was filming modified car events back in 2013. I um, met up with the Korean developments guys that have modified cars through doing parades through London for a friend of mine and got me that got me into the modified scene. Those videos did really well. So that was another pivotal moment um, that I realized, wait a minute, the modified car scene is on like no one's filming it. Like literally there were no YouTube channels specializing, especially in car shows in the modified scene. It was all supercar, supercar, supercar. Um, so I think I'd like to think I was the first to, to film, especially like modified cars leaving a car show. Cause I'd realized they would, they would put on more of a show than someone in his Ferrari would do. For example, I have seen Ferrari send it out of junctions and I've heard stories of Ferrari spinning out while showing off or even not showing off. Um, but, um, so yeah, so I'd film a lot of cars leaving and, um, people don't like that because obviously some a lot of people would, would see the camera and think, oh, it's my time to shine. And then they'd show off. And then that would obviously put some venues at risk because the council would like, oh, we don't want this dangerous driving happening. So they would essentially shoot the middleman. They would, they'd put the blame at me, even when nowadays, back then I was the only one filming. I can kind of understand then. I would be on my own at the junction, the only one filming cars leaving. Now, hundreds of people do it. No, a good word. So, yeah. so the first time I ever actually saw you stood next to the road safe filming mm -hmm. was I came in in the old Porsche yes. um, to Goodwood and you were one of maybe 20 people yeah. lying down the road so, on the roundabout. Yeah, like, even with like Reading, the Reading Japanese me, I, I was... The, Picking your spot must be quite a difficult yeah, bit. So that's like fishing. Where are you going to go I around know. the lake? Oh, I, I know the kind of the good spots, but yeah, the Reading me, I was the first one to ever film the cars leaving there. And then suddenly you get, I think we had like 200 people stood at the exit now every time it happens. And I, it was me. It's them from, and then I thought, okay, I'll do cars arriving because no one else is doing that. And now you get 20 people filming cars arriving as well. So yes, from those cars leaving videos, some event organizers don't like that. And if event organizers come to me saying, oh, could you not film the cars leaving? I, I've always respected that. And I've said, okay, that's fine. I won't. So I, I know the venues that don't like. <laughs> but they actually banned you from the event. But this event, they, instead of just having a, a conversation with me, I tried to reason with them saying, 
don't worry, I, I won't. I, I, I genuinely, I said to them, it's okay. I won't film the cars arriving. I won't film the cars leaving because they said the council don't want cars driving back dangerously. They, they can't be having people stood on the roadside filming cars arriving and leaving. Um, so therefore, you are banned from our event, is, is the words. So I was like, okay, no, that's fine. You can, I, I promise I won't film the cars arriving. I won't film the cars leaving. I will just film inside the event and make a nice video from it. That's what I said. And, they, and he said, nope, you, you are banned. Make other plans. And the trouble of that is I... No, 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 sir. <laughs> so, hmm, about that. Um, I, that weekend the show was scheduled for, I had planned to go to Le Mans for the 100th anniversary of Le Mans. I love Le Mans cars. They are my favorite cars ever. Um, but I can't go to Le Mans shows every weekend, so I have to go to the other other stuff. But yeah, if you ask me my favorite types of cars, Le Mans cars through all the years, from the Bentley blowers to the latest ones. Um, but unfortunately, I was meant to go with some, uh, a friend of mine and he books with his, his group um, without me, essentially. It's all fine. It's all fine. Um, so almost in process, I was like, right, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going, I'll book something else. So th this show that had banned me, I, I booked to go to the show and a big group of us, we all decided to go down. So we'd all booked hotels because it was about two hours away from me. So we had hotels booked as well as the show books. So I was like, well, I've already booked hotels. And even though I knew that my hotel was refundable because I always have a bit of just in case I make sure something is refundable because I know plans can always change. That's also why I never really announce where I'm going to be. I've got like a blanket uh, short re reply to people when they say, oh, you're coming to this show. I'd say, I don't announce my whereabouts because plans can change. So yes, I, I covered that. But other friends of mine, their hotels weren't refundable. And I was like almost like the common denominator. I was the, the reason that they were all meeting up. So if I wasn't there, they wouldn't really want to go. And then they would have just paid 100, 200 pounds for a hotel just because I've been banned for an event, I wouldn't go and then they wouldn't go and they'd lose money. So I'm like, I, I said to him, like, my friends have booked hotels. We've all booked hotels. They're non-refundable, even though mine was, but that doesn't matter. My friends' ones weren't. We, we're still coming. And he said, no, make other plans. Don't come. So we hatched a plan. I was like, this is going to make a great video. Unfortunately, the views didn't pick up as well as I thought they would do. It was a fairly average viewed video, but I think it was quite entertaining. Um... I was going to go go in, in disguise. And um, I, I won't say who, because I don't want them to get into trouble, but a, a, a company that happens to be trading at the show found out about this. I spoke to them about it, and they, they bought me a Where's Wally outfit and my girlfriend. So we dress as Where's Wally or Wally? Wally? Wally. Where's Wally? Where's Wally? Wally. We dress as Where's Wally, both the two of us, and walk around the show seeing if he could be spotted. And the whole time it was people like double taking, like, oh, it's Adam, because I was wearing the glasses and the hat. I'm not as recognizable. And then as the event went on, I hadn't been spotted. We were hiding from like the security and the marshals. Constantly been evolution, whether it's the evolution yes. of putting your face on camera, whether it's the evolution of finding out right at the beginning that you could actually earn from YouTube. Yeah. Now we you've got multiple parts to this Atom C brand, basically, yeah. which is YouTube AdSense revenue, but you've also got sponsorship, mm. an event named after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And merchandise. Yeah. Explain how those bits come about and why they're important to you and what that's done yeah. to say your growth, your ability to do more, etc. So merchandise, as I am wearing here, has never been like a money make it is it does obviously make a bit of money, but it's never been a the point has not been to make money. The only reason I started merch is because people started asking for merch. So they wanted like my quotes on on t-shirts. So everyone loves the white chaser was a quote that I started because back in 2014, the Toyota Chaser, there was like one on the scene, then the gradually few more came and a lot of them were in like the JDM white color. And the chasers, they would send out junctions and they'd sound amazing because they've got a one JZ, which is like a super engine, but smaller and slightly different. And but people still didn't know what they were. So in the comments, people were like, that was amazing. What is it? And I just started saying, well, everyone loves a white chaser. And then that became a quote. And then it's like bring neons back and other other quotes and things I decided to put on t-shirts because people asked for them. So I provided them. Um, so this is literally print on demand. This t-shirt in particular is so many years old. That's why it looks a little bit tired now. Um, this is literally the first piece of merch I, I bought out properly. Um, and it, yeah, it's print on demand. So I get like £2.50 per, per t-shirt or something. I get like pennies from it, but I don't have to do anything. I I, I, design, I used a bit of my 
university degree, my graphic design to design the t-shirts. And I just uploaded them onto the site. And then when an order's put on, T-Mail, do, do the printing, do, make the t-shirt, send them out and then deal with all any kind of returns if anything happens. And I don't have to do anything, just upload the designs and I get like a couple of quid. Uh, so that's merch because people wanted it. And I think it was, it was maybe around lockdown that, that I started it or maybe lockdown, I came up with some more ideas for merch as well. But I mean, lockdown was, was a lot of ideas had to be made because as I said, like there were no car shows. Where did the idea of Adam Seafest come from? You literally had yeah. your own car show called Adam Seafest. Yeah. Surely that brings back memories of watching Top Gear Studio full of people at Dunsparce. Uh, it has to. But again, as I said earlier, it's hard to uh, compute, tie that into that. But like the first, I, I, people, because I go to car shows, people say, oh, you should host your own show all the time. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. It's too, it's so much effort to put it on us. And it's a bit of cliche. And I was like, no, no, I, I'm, I, it's not about me. It's about the, the shows. It's about the cars. It's about the content. I've always had that persona. I do little bits of videos about me and my cars that I've bought and stuff. But my channel is about the cars. It's not about me. I just present it and provide entertainment with it. Um, but then over lockdown, I kind of hosted an ev events of my own that I would never really publicize as my own because you weren't allowed to host events because I, I realized you can't have car shows. So what about just people driving past the camera? If I say I'm on this roundabout, you come to me, drive past. So it gives people to take a reason to take their cars out, which you were allowed to do at the time. And I could still stay distant from people. I could just be there on my own. Uh, a couple of friends would join me for the first couple of episodes and um, just say, look, I'm going to be at this roundabout. Shepherd and Flock near Farnham was the first ones I did um, because I knew that was a good roundabout. If no one turned up, it's still good for general car spotting. And But people would turn up. People would uh, drive past and some people would park up and join and watch the other cars. And then in the end, I, I did four at uh, the Farnham roundabout. Then I went to the Denby's roundabout, um, Denby's Wine Estate, um, did two there. And I think they were, we had about 200 people that was stood in the area, not necessarily distanced. Um, I was like, people are turning up and so many cars. Then I decided I'd go up north, well, towards the north. Um, not, <laughs> Birmingham. Not, 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 it was beyond <laughs> Birmingham. So that, that's north. It was in the Peak District um, in near Audley Edge. There was a roundabout that, um, and Audley Edge is quite a wealthy area. So I was like, well, if, again, if no one turns up, I'm, I'm so far from my comfort zone because most of my viewers and audience are down in the South because they're the shows I tend to uh, go to. So I went there and so many people turned up and the police found out about this show. I will come on to Adam Seafest, but this is kind of the stepping stone up to it. The police found out what well, there's a car show happening on a roundabout on this orderly edge bypass. What's going on? And I was staying with my friend Ollie that I mentioned earlier with a triumph because um, he he's moved up here because he's a traitor to the south and um, <laughs> that sounds really bad um, no he's moved up there uh, with his girlfriend and um, so I was staying with him so I drove my Nissan up to his house and just ran him a state which is about half an hour from Audley Edge and on the morning of the drive-by car show which is what we called it drive-by car show it was a it was an idea of me and, and a friend of mine Chris he came up with the base idea so I've got to thank him for that idea of the, the whole drive-by car show idea um, at the morning of the organized car show, which is from 11 a.m. till maybe 3 p.m., I had police officers knock on my friend's door asking for me. So the police had managed to track me down, stay at my friend's house three or four hours away from where I genuinely live. I was like, Adam, the police are here for you. He's like, what? How do they know that I'm staying? So I think what they did is they found, like, use AMPR and cameras in the area. They they knew my number plate of my 350Z through Instagram, and they tracked down roughly where the car had been driving the day before. And then they were patrolling around the neighbourhood where my friend lives. Found the car parked outside his house, so knocked on his door. Spoke to me about it. They just didn't know what was going on. So like, um, we 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 heard you're hosting a car show on a roundabout. So I literally just had to clear with them. Oh, it's just a drive-by car show. I told. I've told people, this is where I'm stood. I've told on all the posts, I've said, please don't drive dangerously because I don't want to have my name twin with that necessarily. Um, just drive past, do a wave to the camera, maybe shout something out the window so it's a bit of humor for the video. Um, so I explain that to the police and they'll say, okay, just so you're aware, the police will be in, have a presence there. Um, so I was like, that's fine. And they let, let me go on with it. 
these days they would say they would they would say no, we're not having that. They'll do some kind of like they didn't really have the power to stop that from happening back then. Um, now they've got more rules and stuff with and, car shows. Yeah, but they've shows. really clamped down on they the have. UK car scene, and that's that's been a struggle with me as well. But we can, we can dive in, tip into that. So they were my first kind of shows that I hosted. I did about seven or eight of them of the drive by car show. That was my way through lockdown because no one else had car shows to go to. So they would turn up these days. I couldn't do a drive by car show again, partially because of the police, but mostly because people have better things to do back then. They were like, Oh yeah, I'll go for a drive and drive past this kid with his camera. Uh, in the end, in orderly edge, hundreds of people turned up up North. So I was like, I, I kind of, shut down the road somewhere but miles away because you forget about those believe followers it. exactly so that was my first experience of people actually do turn up for me and then Chiro who you've had on this podcast before he hosts events previously at his Shambrook Hotel that I would frequent myself so I got to know him through there and then with the Petrol Hedonism Club he would host other events at other venues um, and he said well why don't we host a car show for you and I was like well this seems quite easy because Chiro can do all the hard work the location, the staff, the security, the toilets, the food, the refunds, the tickets, the sales, the everything. And I just put a name to it and promote it. Um, so it was a working title. So, oh, it's like Adam Seafest, this kind of thing. What what should we call it? Oh, I don't know. Couldn't think up with a name. And in the end, we just stuck with Adam Seafest. It sounds a bit cringy, but it's it's it now rings off the tongue. It's like a household name. It's did you say earlier there was 6,000 people that turned up for that? So for the first one we did, which was 2020. Two, um, at Wilson Mill, which is an outdoor casting track. So it's a nice venue. And the venue of a car show makes a car show. Like a car show on, on just a, a grass field doesn't have the same vibe as something with like a bit of this, bit of that. So we got to car park cars on an outdoor karting track. Um, so we had like the rumble strips and it was a great visual and you had bits of grass in the middle. Yeah. Then you had a car park around the Some side. people love Goodwood. And yeah. Um, so it was, and it was in the middle of the country in Nottinghamshire, no, Northamptonshire. And, uh, so e off the M1, easy for people to attend. And, um, so that first one, we, it's hard to know numbers. I'll tell you why in a bit, but I think we had four to 5,000 people or let's say three to 5,000 people, maybe four, um, turn up for the first show that I'd ever hosted. And this was a ticketed show. And I was like, this is amazing. And I, I stood there, I had all, I had three cars at the time, the Cobra, the MG, and my 350Z. And I was stood there as people were coming in, people would come up to me because they would go to meet me and then a queue would start forming. And this wasn't organized and I was just talking to people and then people would be, oh, there he is. Oh, I'll wait behind this guy. I'll wait behind this guy. People were queuing to speak to me. I was like, this was not planned. This I did not expect this to happen. I was like, this is amazing. And I just spent the whole day, I needed to make a video. I've spent the whole day just talking to people and getting selfies and signing things. I remember the first time I was asked for an autograph this was going back to like 2013. It was a Bewley event. I think it was a uh, Japanese event at Bewley. Some kids said, oh, and I, I kind of at the back of my head thought this might happen one day. So I was like, oh, what do I do? So I started doing my bank signature then thought, no. Um, so I did some scribbles, three or four. And, and I was like, well, there you go. And then my, my now signature autograph kind of thing is a, a development of what I did on that day. So yes, yeah, so I was doing autographs and it was, it was just unbelievable and then the 2023 one was even and bigger then, yeah this year we hosted at the same venue and we had about six thousand people turn up and the same thing happened people queuing to see me literally i have to spend half an hour running around the show literally running like the pied piper if you've seen that i did a video from it there's about 10 to 20 kids following me the whole time being in the background of the video just just like just me walking around the show and everyone wanted to see me in action you meant what is your average demographic on the channel so it's actually a, about my age i'd say about like late 20s on average maybe mid 20 early I, I think the 20s maybe that's probably that's probably early 20s maybe maybe i'm growing up a bit too much out of this because it's people that have maybe got their first second their first modified car that kind of age is the average so people that have maybe got their first rear wheel drive car but there is such a broad, like the, the like age, nature. Yeah. Uh, the uh, age gap from like 18 to 28 and from 28 to 38, they're actually quite equal. So I've got quite a big, okay. um, and also the younger audience, they don't really, we Plus can't got all the gas kings guys. 
yeah. Um, we've not got the demo. We can't see the demographics of children watching because they don't have accounts because they're too young to have an account. So we right. can't really see how many uh, five to ten year olds are watching, how many ten to fifteen year olds really, because they don't have YouTube accounts. So we can't see them as a stati- statistic. So we've probably there's probably a large younger audience. But, but you do film your videos with that in mind, don't you? There's a lot of kids that also watch your channel. Yes. Yeah, so I've never there's never been any swear words in any of my videos. Uh, more recent years, I've allowed a bit more swearing if if I hear someone and I just bleep it because it adds a bit of comic effect having a beep from a swear it's a bit funny but and there's a few like innuendos in the videos that maybe the younger people wouldn't understand but it's no like direct sexual jokes um so no I'm very aware that younger people do watch the videos so there's no swearing and it's all kind of if, if, if a lot a lot of the time people come up to me parents say oh unfortunately we have to listen to your voice every day because our kid little jimmy w- loves the video so we hear your voice throughout the house so i'm always aware that parents do watch my videos so i want them to be entertained as well as well as happy for their kid to watch and you have to create an environment we mentioned a minute ago that adam seafest was one part of another variation of income to mm. bring the channel to a new level yeah you got your merchandise which does a bit maybe not loads but that's another quiver to your bow and then you've got your YouTube spon- um, ad revenue, which you've always had, but you've also built in sponsors. Yes. So Adam Seafest was genuinely like, it helped. Um, I've, we maybe touch upon this. I've just bought my first house and it helped furnish the house. So that's right, okay. having my Adam Seafest. So thanks everyone. All that, like we, we, me and Cherry, we went like in together 50 50 kind of thing. And it, it wasn't, again, like the merch, it wasn't necessarily with the idea to make money. It was just, it was a step in my kind of career and people what, what have always been asking, you should host your own car show. So that's why I did it. As I said, numbers, we can't really tell because tickets were either spectator, which is per person or show car. And you, you don't know how many people, people are in a show car. car. So yeah. We can't really, but we think 6,000 people, maybe 7,000 police had to close the road this year because it got too busy. We had two, three miles of traffic to come in. So for next year's show, we're going to have to find a new venue maybe or range of traffic so that isn't kind of meant again like the t-shirts isn't meant to be a source but is a source of income but that's not why i do it whereas the sponsorship as a lot of youtubers youtubers will tell you a sponsor in a video can pay you a lot more than youtube ad revenue youtube ad revenue is good like some people complain about it like oh you get peanuts and yes in you don't get as much as people see because people um, look at the likes of I, I've mentioned Shmi quite a lot because he was a bit of the, like the the OG in the in the scene and he's got like twenty plus supercars I don't I can't I've lost count maybe not quite twenty at the moment but he's got a whole lot of supercars and people just think oh wow YouTube must be paying well but it's not because he's got like like you were saying he's got hands in so many shell at one point yeah. and yeah, th- yeah there's a range of things i'm actually hoping tim has agreed to do an episode on the yeah. podcast he will so, be he'll be great um it's just actually getting it sorted yes um so sponsorship does does help as well so i've uh, well we're both going to sema this uh, this year in vegas um so i've vegas, managed to, uh, oh, no, I'm, going to be... I'm going to vegas with adam C. Yeah. <laughs> there's going to be videos of me doing the groovy macarena to a side that's going to be crazy um, so I've managed to get sponsorship to cover just the costs of that. So it helps with travel. Um, and I do have regular sponsors, like I'm wearing a, a watch that is a sponsor of mine as well. I've got loads of their watches and I've got Y food, a, a drink um, that's like a meal replacement that I do as well. Um, and over lockdown, sponsorships were a lot easier. Or well, the 2020, that year, there were quite a few sponsorships uh Opportunities, companies, yes, companies with with money that were ready to put into uh, to marketing. impressions and views. Yeah. yeah. Whereas now, maybe either because these companies are putting their money elsewhere, or the YouTube, uh, Instagram, and TikTok market is so saturated, maybe it's harder. It's definitely harder to get sponsorships these days. And I've never been good at being proactive and saying, "Hey, would you like to sponsor my video?" Because I hate the whole stigma of Oh, this influencer, he wants something for nothing. Like I've never asked for like strange that though, that the, the influencer stigma now. I think it's I actually think that's caused by there being too many fake influencers suppose, online. Yeah. There's so many people that can buy eight hundred thousand followers. Yeah. I actually think the blue tick things now helped a lot, but there were so many people that could do that. Blue tick. Then go the go to Dubai. Yeah, but I think that actually has helped because some people were pretending to be others. Mm. And that it has cut that out a bit, but I think 
in a way that they've caused a problem for themselves. They've not yeah. properly managed those social yeah. media platforms. I don't want to be they... the guy that goes to a company saying, I want your body kit and I want you to put it in my car. And I'm, I'm, for that, I'm going to give you exposure because I've never, I've never tried to do that. If, if companies come to me saying, we're happy to give you uh, an air filter or something in, in return, we, you can put in your video. I'm like, absolutely. Yes. That's a great help. Um, but same with sponsorships, like monetary returns. I don't want to be that. Oh, hi. But you kind of need to be. And I'd imagine most YouTubers have like a marketing team to like contact um, other manufacturers and put them in touch. But I never have. I've always been a very proud one man, one man band. So I do all the editing, all the planning, all the, all the shows myself, all the um, emails. I've, I've, I've read every single comment that I've ever received on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Every single one of them. There must be millions. I've read them all. All my emails. Everything. It's all me. And I don't have time for that. So um, what makes you, do you think, that way? Quite particular. I don't know. Maybe I'm selfish. <laughs> I, 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 I think pride. Like, because I can see this channel, this Adam C that's been created, this, this mostly the YouTube and, and the views and the, the people I've met, the fans, the people that follow me and, and what I've created. That's all me from like, yes, obviously I can't say, oh, from no help from anyone else. No, friends of mine have absolutely helped me uh, like hold the camera and give me lifts places and give me advice and recommendations and and reading all the comments that allows me to learn what my viewers like, what they want, what they don't like. And I can also have a bit of fun with the haters. I can reply to them sarcastically then all the other people back me up and I can just watch as this argument starts. I'm like, that's your fault. The Adam C army. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just being proud of what I've created and that was all basically down to my effort and maybe going back to the university stage just saying that maybe that whole university period wasn't a waste of time because I did started building what I have now achieved at uni and it wasn't a waste of time because now I am here and I have done this um but I don't want to be selfish and say me 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 but do you, do you worry where everything is going Yes. Yeah. Because um, I've, I've had other guests on. Uh, I don't think you mind me saying the likes of uh, Paul, mm-hmm. Zoom the London. I'd say maybe he's lost a little bit of passion yeah. what he's doing recently. Um, views have, have dropped off. Yeah. And, and it's like something that you a few years ago was going so strongly. Yeah. Can sometimes be taken away. And there's obviously a lot of focus on the UK car scene in terms of it's been covered more on, on the news, like car cruises, I think yeah. is the word that they use to cover it on the news. Do you ever worry with electric vehicles and less passionate people about cars, like where this is going to be in 10 years? Yes. So I'm very aware of Paul's journey, for example, and where he's, where he's come from and how a, a little bit of his, like us YouTubers back from, you've got your chocolate cider. Our YouTubers back from, um, back in the day, like we used, we used to talk to each other. We used to spend time with each other. There's not many other YouTubers that I haven't met or known. So I do know a lot of these people and I, I'm very familiar with, Paul's channel and how it's how it's gone, how it's been going, and what's happening with it now. And I I'm, I feel very fortunate that I still have that spark that I I still enjoy and love going to car shows. Some of them, yes, I I do go there just to make content. I don't enjoy them as much, especially if I go to a show and I'm like, there's no content here. I could have been doing something else. I could have gone to another show. I should have gone that extra mile. I want to travel more to go to different shows because I'm seeing the same cars at the same shows in my catchment area if you want but i still have that passion but with the way that uh, tiktok and instagram and people's attention span is shortening so people don't want to watch long form videos as much as they used to because now they've got that short um i, I hate it that there's actually an example of this that i've seen yeah. recently it's got to the point i think everybody would have seen this where you can go on tiktok or instagram now on a reel and to just keep people engaged listening to a podcast clip. And yeah. I, I refuse to do this. They'll put like a car tumbling down a game, like oh, underneath, underneath, yeah, underneath it. Yeah, because people don't have the because attention. Because they, they, they're then paying attention yeah. to two things. So it holds them on the video a bit longer. Yeah. I'm like, is that really what we've come yeah. to? As like I think it's definitely the, the younger audience that maybe have that less of attention span. So, and um, without sponsorship... TikTok's short form video content earns pennies. Like you can earn 10 times as much 
maybe more from the same view count from a 10 minute video than you can from a, a one minute TikTok or yeah. YouTube short Instagram reel. I don't even know if you can uh, monetize Instagram reels you might, without sponsorship. Sponsorship will be able to pay for like they can if they know you're going to get like a million views on TikTok, then they will happily sponsor. But but people a million views on TikTok isn't the same. No, like I can see that it's giving younger people so much enthusiasm and, and enjoyment out of becoming a social media person. They see, I've got a million views on this TikTok video. But unfortunately, trying to convert that into earning a living from it is very difficult versus a million views from, from YouTube and longer form videos because that's kind of where the, the money is. And I, again, I've never, my channel was a hobby that became a career. Which is now just funded a house. And I've now just funded a house, four cars, and um, my my life through it, um, through this journey that I've been through. And I do worry that what if YouTube isn't necessarily a thing, in, but it's lasted so long, it's easy to get comfortable in it, but I need to start having a plan in mind. And everyone tells me this, and other I know other influencers do have ideas in mind of what to do if and when that happens, when you, your ability to, because a lot of us, our main source of income is YouTube ad revenue or our main source of views or monetizable sponsorship is from, from YouTube. Matt Armstrong, Shmi is still doing very well on YouTube. There are Facebook and Instagram pages, but we need to be relevant on every single platform just as that backlog. Facebook video, for example, can earn the same amount per view as YouTube does. But I don't, because I am a one-man band, I don't have the Can't time to put... And and if you upload the same video from YouTube onto Facebook, Facebook will see that and demonetize your whole page. And that's happened to me twice now. So I, even though I am trying to re-edit it for Facebook, they're still like, no, that's just a YouTube video that you've re-jumbled. Even though they, they, I've had a meeting with Facebook, they said, yeah, you can do that. But it's still like the, the, the creator guidelines as well on YouTube. That's very difficult, like dangerous driving, YouTube demonetizes dangerous driving. I know like whistling or diesel. limits ad revenue. Has had... Uh, there's trouble with that, but yeah, limiting ad revenue from dangerous driving. So I need to be careful with that. And um, obviously swear words, but I've never had swear words in the channel, controversial topics. And there's just so much. I do actually think this has been the most well-spoken episode of the podcast. So yeah. Far to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think me and Tavares are a little bit more colorful maybe, yeah. with the, the language used. On I, the I, 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 that's but, what I mean. I've never, I've never sworn because I, that sometimes that can affect. No, that's better. Yeah. So I've been I wish I was like up. that. That was my yeah. new, that was genuinely my New Year's resolution. Yeah, um, I've been kind of almost like brought up to to be like that, and just almost, sometimes there's a bit of humour about it, trying to avoid the the swear word that they know you want to say. But um, my last question, yeah, have you got any advice to the kids that are still stood on the roundabouts at car shows filming, thinking, "Oh, this will never go anywhere." Yeah, what, what's what's the thing that if they did actually want to pursue? a career online, a career trying to be in what they're at, yeah. loving doing. What do you think is a critical factor? Yeah, I could, I could look into the camera and say, be yourself. Um, I've always said passion and consistency are the two key points. I feel like I need a third because three is a magic number, but I've always said passion. So if you're, if you're passionate about it, you can keep consistent. And then if you're consistent, that's when you, if consistent twinned with that passion is how you can create success. So I've always thought passion and consistency, when people ask me for advice, that's the easiest way of me to say that's that's what you need. Maybe luck is the third one because there is luck. Dog says cat from Fox. Um, but also you can't, you can take, uh, you can take inspiration from other channels, from other people, people that you look up to, people you inspired, but, but copying their exact niche isn't going to work because you need you need your own exact niche. There are channels out there that are copying my exact niche that I have formed through 12 years, 11 years of doing this properly. That's been my gradual niche that has been created. And then there's channels that have been looking at that. It's like, oh, that's the way to get views. So they just try and do that. And they're, they're never going to be that. Uh, so they need to try and do something different, find their own niche, use that as inspiration, but, but keep... Make sure you're enjoying it. Don't do it for the wrong reasons. Keep the passion and then keep that consistency. That sounds like good advice, I think. <laughs>
Adam C three zero four six. Oh yes. Thank you for coming on Road to thank Success Vision much. Podcast, and we're now going to get to actually tuck into some snacks with oh, yes. Steve over yeah, there. Yeah, snacks. So let's yep. do that. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't before. Hit the thumbs up button, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a mess. <laughs>